Stated, I am February, just like the month, but I am taller. <laughs> um, oh, and on the internet, I have no tea. So we've already gone over my content warnings, and yeah, I realized that there was a very obtuse reference to needles, so we addendum. Um, so I work on, I work at GitHub, and I'm on the community and safety team, and what we do is work on tooling infrastructure and educational stuff to help communities on GitHub become not just safe, not just diverse, but actually inclusive and spaces where diversity can happen because there's an inclusive atmosphere. And so um, I have this really awesome team. I wish I could have brought all of them. I brought Danielle. Um, she's she's going to be speaking about not GitHub stuff later. So, um, and we one of the things we've been asking ourselves is we look at like how do we actually make a difference you know, on our platform? How do we not end up like another Reddit um, in terms of the social aspect on the open source projects that use GitHub? And it's like we're, what, what does even safety even mean in an online context? Because a lot of people like to dismiss safety online of like, well, you can't actually be hurt on the internet. Like it's not the real world. Um, and so, you know, one of these working definitions, and it's, that's, it's just that, it's not an official like GitHub definition, it's just something we use inside of our team, is that safety is the ability, online safety is the ability to participate in online interactions without fear of virtual or real world reprisal. Because it actually is dangerous on the internet, and online spaces actually have real world dangers that go along with them. And there's some very like blatant obvious ones, like doxing, being swatted, if you don't know what that is, especially if you're not from the States, um, where there are times where if a group, such as the aforementioned group we will not mention by name, <laughs> gets, doesn't like you, and they can they get your personal information, and then you know putting that out there is doxing, they will occasionally call up law enforcement with false reports, and you can have the terrible, terrible law enforcement that we have in the United States come into your house with full SWAT gear, breaking down doors with assault rifles. Um, fortunately, there's yet to be a death from this. The scary thing is it's still happening because the police don't vet these calls very well. And so there's an actual real world danger to just saying something like, hey, I think LGBT people should be treated like humans. You can actually incur the wrath of the internet. And so you have these, these big problems. And on top of that, even when you're not doxxed, even when where you live is private and all this other stuff is Harassment online can actually turn into very real real traumas. You can actually have situations where it's like, oh, I actually avoid this topic now because if I ever see this topic, it brings up all of this emotional stuff. I've had stress, I've had physical health problems, and you can actually be harmed in terms of trauma and PTSD around things that happen just on the internet. There have been countless suicides based on online bullying and harassment. And so creating safe online spaces is something that's really important and that my team takes very seriously and we want to share some of the stuff that we've been talking about and working on um, in hopes that any of you who are involved in any form of online community can take a lot of this back and do something with it. Um, one of the easiest ways to make a safe community is to just limit the interactions. But you don't really have community in that case. Here's my little sketch of, you know, like the Hearthstone responses. You know, you play this little card game and they give you six things you can reply to your opponent with and that's it. And this is great because it makes the game fairly safe um, compared to like you know playing Overwatch with on the PC where you've got real time chat and or voice and you have to deal with all this toxicity and negativity. It's like here the worst they can do is do their threat and taunt over and over and over and then you mute them. And but the problem with that is like you don't actually get a real community. You don't get a depth of interactions. And for in the case of like GitHub, you can't build software that way. <laughs> we couldn't give you just reactions and allow you to build software. Um, it might be kind of interesting to see if we, somebody can come up with like a way to do open source with just reactions. Um, we do have emoji reactions now on comments, but once again, you actually have to have content. So like these lim limiting interactions actually means you have to leave part of yourself at the door. You can't actually come with your full self. You're, you can't engage in these situations. Um, we'll come back to that one. So I want to talk about two major different types of harassment that you can, you'll see. And talk about the way that we respond to these is very, very different. Um, or the way that we would encourage people to respond to these is very, very different. And on the one hand, we have something like blatant racism. Um, that A good example of this in GitHub context might be where you open a pull request and then somebody 
says we do not take you know pull requests from n words, um, and is just blatant. This is uh, and then the flip side is you might have like microaggressions, and here's the case where a, a independent group actually did some d some data digging on GitHub and discovered that if you're if you are female, your code submissions on open source projects are actually more likely to be accepted than if you're male but only if you have a gender neutral username, if they don't know you're female. If they know you're female, it goes down. So with this sort of, the way we, we can infer from this is like, oh actually, so there's a statistical bias that females might actually write slightly better code, <laughs> <laughs> and yet we're rejected more often. And so this is a form of like a microaggression. It's even hard to show in a single instance that this has actually happened, because a single instance might be all above the board look fine. Um, another example um, that we see is sometimes a project will accept submissions from clear people who are clearly g um, any gender, but you'll see like extra scrutiny from the ones that are submitted by a known female user. And it might be like, oh, the average number of comments on a pull request is like, you know, five to 10, and then we have this one with 60 to 100. <laughs> and it's one of those where like every last one of those comments might even be, le be legitimate, like legitimate feedback. But it's the case where it's like, well, the guy who did that, there was five other pull requests he didn't even leave a single remark on. And then he goes and digs super deep and rubber stamps this other person's. And if you look at any individual action, there's nothing there. And this is an example of like an online microaggression. And so there's very different responses for something where it's like blatant, like you actually just want to express your bigotry. <laughs> and the microaggression case, when a lot of cases, people legitimately don't believe they have these problems because they're, they're internal intrinsic biases, and um, they don't want to have these problems, or at least that's our hope. So in the case of something like blatant racism, you know, banning, banning, blocking, redacting, the sort of big guns of old time moderation from back in the BBS days, you know, of the 80s with our modems. <laughs> um, and, you know, we have the ban hammer. And you can just basically be like, hey, guess what? Our terms of service says you're not allowed to be a blatant racist. And you know, we're able to just kind of like shut that down. Um, the way this plays out like in the office space is in countries that have good anti-harassment laws, if somebody's blatant, you can often actually, you know, just a report to HR will make this sole legal chain of events. Um, in California, it's particularly good. If somebody does something blatant, there is a whole legal set of ramifications that happen just by making a single report, and it's pretty awesome. So like, we have some of these analogs both in the real world and online of just like, you are being intentionally bigoted and terrible, and guess what, we can just make you go away. Because we don't actually think you're going to get better, and you're not contributing to this community, you're causing harm. The flip side is with these like microaggressions and these things where people don't realize that their actions are harmful. Um, we have a very different response that we want to encourage. And this is a case where we actually, we can make tools that foster this, but we can't actually do this. It comes down to people actually learning how and knowing how to do the right thing. And that's like coaching people to understand what actually has happened and address the actual actions they've taken and the impact that those actions have. And this is where we actually find that you can actually change behavior over the long term. Um, because otherwise you have these unsafe spaces where people are like, I'm going to come out, I'm going to participate, and it's great. And then they find like, oh, I'm just getting negative criticism, negative criticism. Or, oh, there's, somebody keeps making these like subtly sort of racist jokes. And, um, you know, which is another example of not a microaggression, but a case where it's like uh, most, not, there are people that make racist jokes that are blatantly bigoted. And there's people that make them that don't actually realize they are racist, but they don't realize they're racist. They don't think of themselves as racist. And when you attack that directly, they'll just be like, you're too sensitive. It's okay. But when you point out, hey, you, you, do you realize how that probably makes my friend here feel? <laughs> um, when you address the impact of those actions, it actually has a much better chance of actually changing their understanding. And there's an actual important thing we've learned that is when you attack an identity directly, when you confront a behavior super directly in a way that makes somebody feel like you're attacking their identity, we, the recent, so there's a lot of interest, there's some interesting behavioral studies around this that have shown that people dig in. So if they feel like you, if you call somebody out on a racist joke by saying, that's jokes racist, they will almost always 
dig in the position that you're just being overly sensitive because they're not a racist, so clearly any joke they told couldn't actually be racist. Um, there's uh, one of the more famous and interesting recent studies around this is around the vaccine. Um, I would like to say debate, but debate's totally the wrong word for what it is. Um, so <laughs> around vaccines, they found that when they present science and facts about efficacies of vaccines and safeties, especially about the safety of vaccines to anti-vaccine families, the anti-vaccine families, the more facts you present them, the more they dig in because you're, it's attacking part of their identity and who they believe themselves to be as um, knowing better than science. When they found that they showed pictures of children suffering measles and stories of other parents telling their videos of other parents telling their story of what they went through with their child or the loss of their child over these things, they found there was a much greater statistical response in terms of people actually changing their position on vaccines. And it had nothing to do with the facts around all this. It had entirely to do with them being able to see the impact of their actions. And that's why when it comes to dealing with people who don't realize that they're being racist, they don't realize they're being bigoted, the trick, the trick is to change their hearts and not their minds. And make sure you, it's, and it's subtle and it's hard, but avoid ever doing anything where you seem to call them out as being a racist or a bigot. It's, um, you know, the, the next best, the best, the best, ah. It's nice if you can be super indirect and show the impact on another human being. And lessening that, at least remember, and this is one of the principles we try very hard in our team, is we always talk about bad actions, not bad actors. So we don't talk about, you know, I did a little bit here when I was talking about the really bad thing people were trying to ban. And even then, like, I'm kind of breaking my own rule because we want to talk about somebody who expresses heavy, you know, racist overtones rather than just saying this guy who's a racist um, for this very reason of trying very hard to make sure that our language around this thing is structured to these things is structured to really attack the actions and the impact they have um, and to not so much focus on fighting the ideas but to change people's attitudes and how they view those around them and give them more empathy and compassion for the rest of the world. And so my encouragement is in your job, in your software projects, um, build beautiful communities, and thank you.